All her life, my grandma June broke stereotypes. She was one of the few women who worked as an architectural drafter. When she learned she was paid less than the men, she was the first to file a lawsuit in New York to challenge her pay. And she won. <laughs> and unlike most people of the Great Depression, she married and divorced lots of men. <laughs> Some she left in the cover of night. Between two husbands, she changed her name by only one letter. <laughs> Yet I never had a relationship with any of my grandpas. Luckily, fifth time's a charm. In her 60s, she married Henry. In a huge Catholic wedding, the bride wore white. <laughs> no, actually they eloped to Circus Circus. <laughs> because life together was a silly adventure. Finally, I got a real grandpa. I was 11 when I met Grandpa Henry. He was always making people laugh, playing pranks, and he loved kids. And unlike her previous husbands, he was well off and generous. He was an electrical engineer for Motorola, very intelligent, and also retired Navy. At first, like schoolyard bullies, the Navy rejected him because he wore glasses. But during World War II, it got desperate. So this sailor with poor eyesight was charged with swimming out to rescue pilots from the ocean and pull them from planes in the 30 seconds before they sank. He saved 43 men. When he married grandma, he smoked like a sailor, but didn't curse or drink like one. He was a strict Christian. He told grandma she didn't have to work, but she was already thriving in multi-level marketing back before it was scammy. <laughs> So she focused on hosting events, and she recruited so many people into her empire that she earned several company cars, dozens of international trips to swanky locales. With a maid and an assistant, she soon forgot how to cook, drive, and run a household. <laughs> Meanwhile, my family moved to Phoenix to be closer to them. My grandparents took us to Rockin' Our Ranch, Oregon Stop Pizza, the Wildlife Park, and they wouldn't let my parents pay. Together, we did puzzles, played video poker, and wrote limericks. They attended all of my performances and milestones, as well as my sister. A few years later, though, my relationship with Grandpa suffered. He didn't talk to me much. His tendency was to ignore what he couldn't accept. In junior high, I'd gotten into grunge, nirvana, drinking with boys who jumped their BMX bikes over my head as I laid in the street. <laughs> In high school, I was goth, which Grandpa approved of even less. <laughs> he quizzed... <laughs> he quizzed me on why I shaved my head or wore black lipstick. He didn't like me as much as my sister, who oddly never did go through an experimental phase, which I found super annoying. <laughs> I was in college when Grandpa had his first stroke. He looked vulnerable in his hospital gown with his IV fed into his arm next to the crude anchor tattoo he'd gotten in the Navy. Uncomfortably, I was wearing something see-through too. <laughs> A loose top I'd worn to class. My behavior hadn't improved. By this point, I was showing up to family functions late and stoned every single time. Grandpa was always hungry and upset that they had to wait for me. As embarrassed as I was, I just couldn't get it together. Eventually, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Thanks to modern medicine, a cocktail of drugs staved off the really bad stuff for 10 years. Though he must have known it was coming, he didn't have a plan for when his health deteriorated, and he seemed to ignore his condition instead. At first, his only symptom was he seemed obnoxious. <laughs> He'd thumb his nose at waitresses, tell them to shut up, and then laugh. <laughs> Later, he told people to fuck off, language I'd never heard from him before. Though he still drove, he got confused, so Grandma would direct him. Why wasn't she driving? Macular degeneration. <laughs> 
She had terrible vision. If she didn't tell him to turn in time, chaos ensued. It was the blind leading the blind. In his mid-80s, we made Grandpa stop driving. Then he got lost, wandered in the street, wet the bed. Our grandpa, who was always so proud and in control. It took professionals to convince my stubborn grandma he needed to go to a home and later hospice. Within six months, he was going to die. And sooner, it seemed, when he got pneumonia. But somehow, he rallied. Next, he forgot how to eat. The feeding tube went in. Suddenly, he was hungry and could eat on his own. Then he forgot how to breathe, but he remembered. Each time, hospice tried to repossess his wheelchair and electric bed because they were only temporary loners. <laughs> this went on for four years. He became a skeleton. He had to be fed purees. His daughters stopped taking him to the doctor. He played with his shit. Still, Grandma visited every week. She relearned how to drive, to our dismay, how to use email, how to live alone, except she could not balance her checkbook. For 20 years, she'd eaten every meal at restaurants, made large donations, bought whatever she wanted, <laughs> and she continued to spend this way. Also, she was scammed repeatedly, even with a big note on her phone reminding her, Yellow Pages is free. Do not give them your credit card number. The savings my grandparents had amassed, their trust funds quickly emptied. Grandpa died this past November, the morning of his 90th birthday. Surprising everyone, he passed before his favorite part, the cake. No matter how ill he was, he always roused an appetite for pie and cake. Ever the event planner, my grandma had set up balloons in a party. She was heartbroken on multiple levels as she brought his cake to the neighbors with the news. Worse, she couldn't afford to bury grandpa in the cemetery plot he'd chosen 35 years ago. Against his wishes, he was cremated. He did, however, get a police escort, flag guard, bugle boy, and gun salute. Grandpa's son-in-law gave his eulogy. Partway through, I left to change my baby's diaper. She screamed the whole time, just like Grandpa, who wore diapers for years and would yell and fight the nurses. Then Grandma, his wife of 25 years, spoke. Now age 92 and with dementia, she gave a seven minute speech. <laughs> it was a bit nerve wracking. Like, Henry did the most amazing woodworking. Then she set down her notes. Oh, you wouldn't believe how talented he was. He did these amazing woodworkings based on photographs of people. And they looked just like the photographs. He built his own woodworking shop. Did you all see his amazing woodworking? Everyone had. It was the centerpiece. This, however, reminded me that Grandpa made one of my grandma and him, one for my mom, my sister at her graduation, everyone but me. Strangely, I felt pouty like a teenager again. As Grandma spoke, I remembered the trips we took, Tombstone, Native American festivals, the luau in Hawaii at which I kept saying how crazy it was that I was eating pig until Grandpa finally said, you know you've eaten pig before. <laughs> and I realized he was right. <laughs> My smart grandpa. <laughs> then I thought of the Mother's Day I ruined, Sunday mornings when I'd show up in club wear, Thanksgiving when I brought a guy I'd met the night before. <laughs> Grandpa's strict religion made him extra judgmental and me self-conscious during the years that no one needs another reason to be. He ignored me like he did the other things he was in denial about. What's interesting is after Grandpa got Alzheimer's, he became more tolerant and loving and open. He made a point to ask about my life, and he really concentrated on my answers to show me he cared even if he couldn't remember. 
When he no longer knew my name, he still got a huge smile on his face when he saw me. Once, at the end, he even identified me as his granddaughter. Loudly and with great enthusiasm, he sang Navy songs with us over and over because he saw how happy it made us that he remembered every word. <laughs> He'd been too reserved for that before, and he was no longer judgy. As memories flooded over me, I had to say something. I found myself at the podium, daunting because I had never been to a funeral and had only seen these speeches in movies, except grandma's speech, which she nailed and got great laughs. <laughs> I spoke about how I had always wanted a grandpa, that he'd make this farting sound with his hands that my sister and I thought was hilarious, that whenever we went to the restroom and came back, he'd ask, Everything come out okay? <laughs> How he was supposed to meet my daughter, his great-granddaughter, at Christmas, but had died one month too soon. My sadness that I never got to show him I became a responsible person overwhelmed me. And suddenly I realized I didn't have an exit strategy. <laughs> a sea of people I'd never met and only five of whom I knew were watching me and I was faltering. What was I doing up here when those who'd known him all his life had declined to speak? How do I get out of this? I was afraid I'd say something sappy just to wrap things up or make grand proclamations like he was a perfect saint, or worse, tap into my theater skills and fake cry. <laughs> Hastily, I thanked my grandma for giving me a grandpa. Everyone sighed, and I sat down. For all that Alzheimer's had taken away, his dignity, his money, his memories, his family, it had actually, strangely, given me back my grandpa. Yeah. That was Jay Carroll.